Um, let's look at some of this is just basic stuff. Uh, look at see the hard shifting uh, on these manual transmissions. This is manual transmission test eight. Uh, usually caused by low lubricant level, improper or contaminated lubricant. You remember I told you if you put oil in the transmission, it's thicker than what it's supposed to have in it. Yeah, the synchronizers won't work right. It'll grind when you put it in gear and that kind of thing. Low lubricant level. If you've got a leak in a manual transmission, you better be fixing it, or it will be destroyed. Because nobody is going to always, before they drive it, they're not going to get up under the car and take that plug out and make sure they got plenty of oil in the transmission. Sooner or later, it's like the tortoise and the hare. The oil always catches up with you, and you burn some up. That's just basically the way that is. Uh, you got shift component damage, clutch adjustment, worn pressure plate. All those can cause hard shifting too. Uh, if the clutch problem is advanced, you can tell by the clutch feel. How does the clutch begin to change feel as the disc wears out? Anybody know? It's loose. Nope. It gets closer and closer to the top. It gets tighter. Yeah, it gets tighter. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when uh, this one guy, he had to bought this uh, Mitsubishi. Well, Dodge Stealth is what it was. It's like a Mitsubishi 3000, and it had a, a manual transmission in it. He bought it, and it had uh, bent valves because it had jump time. So he pulled the heads off. He fixed all of that. He put it back together, and his clutch was right on the top, and it was really, you know, didn't want to catch all that good. And it just so happened that one had a clevis where the pedal connected to the uh, master cylinder, the clutch master cylinder, mm -hmm. and we made a little adjustment right there, and he had a nice clutch that he could use in. But his lining, some of it was gone, and that's why his clutch got tighter and tighter and closer to the top. All right. Um, something else I want to say too. A lot. If you if you get a cheap, crummy second-rate clutch, and you can find some out there, you're gonna have one that doesn't last long. You know, you'll be changing it again after a while. You know. Uh, but there's also situations where if the parts store is wanting four hundred dollars for a clutch, check with the dealer, and you may find out you can get one for hundred fifty-five dollars. All right. Uh, I've seen that before. Right. Okay. Uh, most manual transmissions make some noise during normal operation. That's called gear rollover noise. You got a mild whine or maybe a rumble down in there whenever it's not in gear. Some people that uh, bought brand new cars and hadn't been used to driving a manual transmission would complain about that when I was at the dealership. Uh, if you got highly audible transmission noise, you know, it's an initial indicator of a lubricant problem because you're going to start. Now, which remember in these, particularly in a uh, rear wheel drive transmission, uh, which two shafts are turning all the time? There's two shafts turning all the time. Even, I mean, if you've got the clutch release, they're turning all the time, even if it's in neutral, there's two shafts that are spinning all the time. The input shaft, because it's cooked into the clutch, and the cluster gear, they're spinning all the time. And the load for that cluster, the load between that input shaft and that cluster gear is actually, actually carrying all the gears as you shift through your gear. So uh, there's a lot of going on up there where that little, around that bearing where the uh, input shaft goes in. All right, now right here, let's look at this right here. We're going to look at a drain and fill. There ain't nothing to that. Uh, you see on that, uh, you're looking right here. What is this right here? Anybody know? It looks like a clutch cable. Transfer case cable on that one, but it sort of looks like any kind of a control cable you'll see under a vehicle. And, you know, it's anchored here, and the cable moves freely on both ends, and it's anchored up at the top, too. All right, now look at this. Look at what they're saying right here. Mark installation reference marks on propeller shafts. What's a propeller shaft? Are we working on airplane, airplanes here? No. We're not, are we? Propeller shaft moves from one thing to another, but not to the... I would call that the drive shaft. <laughs> Believe it or not, that's the drive shaft. You got me? All right, so here we are. We're going to support the transmission with a jack. See, this is a transmission right here. You're going to take your catalyst off. And uh, what is this right here? <laughs> Backup, backup light switch. switch. You guys are really good. How did you know that? Okay. All right. Now, right here, uh, basically, now, where is this particular picture? Where is that? Directly underneath. Underneath what? Transmission. No. It's between the transmission well, the and the shift boot. boot. Yeah, that's the shift tower. Remember shift tower. And when you pull this there off, you're going to see this opening right here. And down in there, you'll see gears and these little rails and all this. See, that's what they call these little, these little uh, things that move the uh, the forks. Those are basically called shift rails. All right. So basically, you're, you're disassembling here. You're pulling your shift. Uh, you actually, before you pull the transmission out, if it's got a shifter going through the floorboard, 
you better be taking that shifter out of there. You know, because it's not going to come out of there with that shifter sticking up through the floorboard, right? All right, you got a counter shaft plug. What's the counter shaft? Cluster gear. Same thing. Remember, I said that last week. Okay, you got to burn this in. Okay, output shaft seal, and we're disassembling this thing. We're actually disassembling it the easy way, uh, and it almost looks like we're wasting time, but we're actually seeing how that thing comes apart, right? Output shaft seal. We're basically got a split housing here, right? All right. Stand the transmission on the rear housing, remove the housing bolts. You're going to have to lift it out of there. You may even have to have a, a lift, I mean, you know, something to raise it up there with. And see your shift rail support plate? That's an interesting way that works. And look at these right here. You know what these are, right? Those are those, uh, the ones that have gears. The, the you got a fifth gear blocker ring and a friction ring. This is an unusual uh, one because they don't usually, well, whenever you're putting these synchronizers together, there will usually be some little slots in there. And they got some little dogs down in here that those slots can move back and forth on. This right here is a little bit different. Basically, it's, it synchronizes it so that whenever you push it into the gear that it's trying to go into, it's going to cause this gear to pick up speed and be the same, you know, as that other. Okay, now right here, you got your input shaft. You got a roller bearing. You recognize that? I see a special tool here. Do you see a main shaft remover? Well, it looks like a main. Yep. So there you go. Got a remover and installer. Now look at that. This is how you stack these things up. They've got a jig. Some of them will you'll stack those things. You'll put them in there uh, horizontally, and on this one you stack it in there vertically. And see, whenever you've got these things together, they now what part is this? That's the uh, main. No, no, no. It's the uh, counter shaft. Counter shaft. Look yeah, down there. Look down there. It says counter shafts number two, right? All right, shift rails and forks are up in here, and this right here is your main shaft. Now, what does the main shaft do? Hmm? That's the one that. Um, actually, they're just pointing this whole shaft. Uh, the main shaft actually is going to go out to the drive shaft. It's split in two. Isn't it's, yeah, it's feeding the drive shaft, and the input shaft is a separate shaft, but it looks like the same thing yeah. until you see that they're spinning separately. All right, and you see these little. Uh, synchronizer sleeves, how you're pulling them off. They got these little detent uh, things here. These are beautiful pictures that they got in this Chrysler shop manual. Okay, right here you're going to remove the main shaft and shift rail fork from fixture. Now, one of the things that is uh, kind of difficult for me to deal with whenever somebody's taking something like this apart and putting it back together, you know, if, especially if they know that it's probably not going to be put in a car and driven, they just sort of, you know, ram it together the best way they can so it looks like it was put together right. Uh, where the acid test is when I make them show me that it will work. You know, put it in every gear and all that kind of stuff. Uh, now here's your synchronizer up. All right. Let's see. Uh, when, we, when you're disassembling the main shaft, have we done that yet? No. All right. When we disassemble the main shaft, what part should be removed immediately before removing the first gear? We're not there yet, are we? All right. We're going to pull our fifth, sixth synchronizer hub. Lift that off of there with a three-jaw puller. So you got to do that with the puller. And there you see your puller up there? Got to pull that off of the puller. And because they go on there pretty tight. If that was slopping around all the time, it wouldn't last. Is it okay. pressed on? Yeah. Except it's, it's not all that tight, really. It's uh, kind of an interference fit. Sometimes they're tighter than others. Um, but uh, that's what Eddie was saying. You can tell these guys how this thing works, but they cry and walk away when they start actually having to do it. <laughs> okay. Sixth gear and bearing. All that reverse gear synchro sleeve. See that? You want to go through there. You got a synchro hub. We're pulling it apart. I'm going to start going pretty fast here. Okay, now wait a minute. Hold on. All right, now what do you got to pull out? Well, but right before, see right here, we're pulling first gear. All right? Reverse gear bearing race. Got it? Number one. See that? There's your bearing race. That's got to come off before you pull this gear. There you go. All right, when you're cleaning the bearings, uh, can you use gunk brand solvent or a reasonable facsimile and then dry the bearings with compressed air? Yeah. Uh, actually, no. That's false, basically. It's never a good idea to spin bearings with your air, ho air nozzle. That's why I'm always trying to caution everybody against. Don't spin the bearings. And sometimes when you're young guys working in a shop that hadn't had any real training, you'll hear those things going, when they spin them up. You ever do that over there? 
Has that done his job? He'll do that to you. No, no, spin him in the air. Man. That would be a bad deal. It'll come apart. And that's pretty doggone. That's like shrapnel, man. It's like flak, you know. Um, all right, here we go. We got uh, on reassembly. Why should welding gloves be worn when installing the first gear thrust washer? Because you got to heat it up. That's right. Got to heat it up. And you got a reverse gear bearing brace with a bearing heater, uh, and the part will be hot. So you don't want to, you know, touch your hand on that. It'd be bad. Okay, we're with three questions in now, and we got to uh, go, to, go on down here. See our counter shaft down there? Right there. Counter shaft's actually got a gear on it because it's got so many gears. They had to make it happen that way. Okay, so technician A says all three counter shaft bearing retainers should be removed before removing the counter shaft bearing. Uh, technician B says the three four synchronizers. Uh, is the only part that needs to be replaced if it shows excessive wear uh, and the counter shaft checks out okay. The answer to that one is neither. Right? Neither one of those guys is right. Okay, now down here, you're looking at uh, the counter shaft shows signs of mirror, minor corrosion, nicks, and pitting. What should be done at this point? A, the counter shaft should be replaced. B, it should be sanded and polished. C, it should be weighed for possible loss of density. No, B. You just clean it up best you can, right? Number two, true or false? Huh? Number two, true or false? Number two. Oh, uh, yeah. All right, so you got an input shaft bearing snap ring there. Have you seen one of these things lately, Lundy? Uh, no, can't say that I have. Yeah, the old bearing splitter. Those bearing splitters out there are really expensive, by the way. If you wanted to buy one, they're a couple hundred dollars if you get a big one like that, you know. Yeah, three of them on a contact truck we never used. Yeah, I saw them in the welding instructor's car too. I don't know what he was doing with those. All right, so here we go. The counter shaft. Let's see. When heating the components that require heating for installation, how hot is too hot? Red hot. Glowing red. Greater red than 350 degrees, or if the component turns blue. Now, let's see the bearing shell puller. That's a cool little tool right there. You put that in there. You put a slide hammer in here. You clink, clink, clink. You pop it out of there. Where should the sink, sixth gear synchronizer friction ring be installed? Hmm? See this right here? See this? Let me stop for a second. See that blocker ring right there? I call it second. This friction surface, that's a slack cone, and this is a slack cone. It's made to match that. And when you go to shift into that gear, it pushes this against that, and it forces that to start turning the same speed as this. And that's how you can manage to go into gear. And when you're downshifting, you'll hear it go wee-doom. You ever hear that? That's when them things work the hardest right there. All right, so greater than 350 degrees or if the component turns blue, is too hot. Where should the sixth gear synchronizer friction ring be installed? It should be in, on the sixth gear. And that was sort of a dumb question if you think about it, right? All right. Here we are. We're putting this back together now. So you're just stacking it back together. When reassembling the transmission, there is a point where the transmission is supposed to be locked into two gears. Why is that necessary? That's smart. Smart answer. you got to hold it so that you can tighten it. In other words, you put it in two gears so you can tighten that, uh, tighten the countershaft bolt to 74 foot-pounds. If the shift fork pads are worn, they can be replaced separately. True or false? False. Well, what do you think about that? Okay, now number 10. Let's go here. What's wrong with this picture? Anybody see anything wrong with that picture? Number the number nine. I mean, number ten. Excuse me. What's wrong with the picture on number ten? Compare it to what you see here. Huh? What'd you say? Yes, she got that right. There's no bearings there. All right. So, all right, did that make you guys happy? You get all that done? Okay, now then, what may I, let me ask you guys this. The ones of you, guys, uh, you two that were working with that uh, escort over there, you got the transmission, you put it back in. Uh, why would it not go in there the first time you stuck it up in there? So you just kept up the leg where it was. And you, but do you think maybe the splines, the splines were bumping the, you know, into it? Sometimes if you turn it, you know, turn the uh, shaft a little bit, it'll go in there. Well, we were, but also had that, that, um, well, well, on the, the engine's got that one little detent that comes out. 
Mm -hmm. I think it was catching on that too. Oh, on the, on the, you talking about on the, uh, the dowel? Yeah, the dowel. Okay, tell me what the dowel is there for. Between the engine and the transmission, you got dowels, you know, the dowels. Sometimes they'll have a bolt that goes through them, sometimes there'll be just bigger pins that stick out and go in there. Why are they there? Anybody know? So you can, Why? So the engine doesn't twist the transmission. So that it, it won't, if it's doing this against those bolts, it works the bolts loose. If you put one together without those dowels, the bolts are probably going to come loose and the transmission is going to try to fall out. I've seen that before. We had a motorhome that was came in with a speedometer issue. And what we found out was, this being a shop foreman got in there, we found out that the uh, engine transmission had been put in and the dowels were left out and the bolts had worked loose and the transmission was dancing around on there loose. Now that was causing issues with the speedometer because it was, I don't know if it was setting up a vibration or whatever, but back there, that's how it showed up and that's how we found it when we tightened it all up the speedometer started working again. It was odd because the speed sensor is in the rear end. <laughs> you know, but it, that was uh, strange that it, that it took us there. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's uh, something on it. Yes, sir. I was wanting to make sure I got number two, number three right. Is it because it'll be, you know, hot? Yeah. Yeah, typically you're going to do that. Uh, what's another reason you might want to wear uh, gloves when you're putting uh, transmission back in there? Because it's sharp. Yeah, it'll cut you. Those things will cut you open. Why would it be hot though? Because you're going to be heating it up so the gear will go in there. Have you ever put a, have you ever replaced a flywheel ring gear on a manual transmission flywheel? I have. You get one and you lay it, you cut the other one off, you just cut it with a torch and let it jump off there. And then you lay it up there and you heat it and heat it and heat it and heat it and it drops in place and when it cools off it's there. I have seen them get loose, you know, and start spinning on there because of whatever reason later on, but that don't usually happen. Now, you know this steel band around a wagon wheel, like what you see on a buckboard wagon? You know what they call that? A tire. It was called a tire before we had tires. And also, you know how they put it on there. The blacksmith built a circle of fires and laid that thing on it and let it get really, really, really hot. And then he got tongs and he put it on that wooden wagon wheel and let it cool off and it would come together and squeak and pop and that's what's holding that wagon wheel together. So it's rolling on that iron, you know, that steel tire over there. But what do they use for bearings in those wooden wheels? Uh, pens. Animal fat. They just had a hub sticking out there, and they'd put it over, and they'd have a uh, you know nut on it, sort of, and they'd have animal fat, and that way that's how it just rolled on there. They had to grease it all the time. It was really the way they had to do stuff back then it was pretty crazy. Okay, that's going to finish us up for this class session today. I got to go to a meeting over in the conference center, and also um, we are going to be working this afternoon, so don't get the idea we're bailing early. All right. Okay.